If you've ever been to a sporting event at a stadium or an arena, in many places there's this phenomenon, social phenomenon called the wave. And this is when you know everyone at some point kind of gets out of their seat and does a motion like this, and you see it going around and around and around the stadium. And if you've witnessed this a number of times, you can start to recognize there's a pattern to how the wave comes to be. And typically it starts with a few people, like really just handfuls of people just in their own little group deciding that they're going to do the wave. You know, so they do the up and down. And if you're another participant in that arena, you say, oh, it looks like those people over there are trying to start a wave. Oh, look, there's a few more over there. And so it starts with just these pockets of enthusiastic individuals that want to start a wave. And they're not totally sure if it's going to work or not, but they're going to try anyway. And then suddenly a few more pockets of people come up. And they're the ones that say, hey, those folks are trying to start a wave. Cool, let's do it too. And they jump right in. And then fairly quickly, it feels like everyone's involved. It has just kind of whooshed up. So you went from these pockets of people to now there's a movement happening. It's going around. And then you get folks like me where it's gone around twice and I realize, oh no, now I'm the only one sitting down. I should probably get up and do the wave too. So it comes around again, I get up and do the wave and hope that it's only gonna come around two more times. And if you've ever experienced this, I'm happy to share that there's actually a theory that describes this type of social phenomenon. Uh, and it, it does describe the wave, it describes many, many other things as well. And it's called the Diffusion of Innovation Theory. It was created in the 70s by a gentleman named Everett Rogers. And it was created to explain how, why, and at what rate new ideas and technology spread. And traditionally, when it was created, it was mainly focused on the spread of technology and ideas. Over the years, we've seen it be very, very applicable to how behavior is spread as well. So it's really exciting. It's one of my favorite. Uh, foundational theories to use when we're thinking about starting a conservation movement and getting more and more people doing the kinds of things we need them to do. So just like the wave, it starts with this small number of innovators and early adopters that are more risk takers than your average person. They're willing to go for it, not totally sure if it's going to work, but they're going to give it a try. And that very first handful of folks are really the innovators and the early adopters are the ones that have seen others doing it, not a whole lot of others, just a few others doing it, and they're willing to jump on board. So they're still risk takers, but they're not the starters. That in itself, you already have a group that's starting to do something, and it's pretty exciting at that point. However, this can be a point where it's not a trend and it's a fad, and it kind of fizzles out after early adopters. But if you can get the early majority starting on board, this is a group that's a bit more selective, not total risk takers. They want to see that other people are doing it. They want to check out to see if this is going to be a fad or not, or if it's going to stick around. And they may even check in to see what some people that they admire and trust think. Now in a wave that's not really happening, that's happening too fast, but with bigger decisions, there may be that checking in with opinion leaders. Now once the early majority comes on board, about 50% of this group, which can be defined as, as either a small group or a large group, has adopted this idea, this technology, or this behavior. So you have what's often called a tipping point here. And that's when you see the speed of adoption really increase. And in the wave setting, that's when it sort of has that whoosh effect of, oh goodness, now everybody's doing this. When did that happen? Because it happens very quickly mainly because this early majority group tends to be a large group. The late majority is also a large group. This is the group that really holds out and they end up joining and adopting because it's actually riskier for them not to. So they're certainly not risk takers and when it starts to look like most people are doing this, they don't want to be left out. And they're not trying to actively resist this movement, they're just you know, waiting to see if they have to. <laughs> and, and certainly at some point, you sort of have to. Uh, and once they're on board, you have 
pretty much 84, 85% of this group totally adopting an idea, technology, or norm. And at that case, it's pretty much considered a social norm. You do have this last group here called the laggards. And they are folks who either won't adopt because they just really seriously don't want to, or they can't adopt, so they don't have access to. So you think about wireless technology, there's a lot of communities out there that don't have access to wireless technology, and that's why they would be in the laggard category, not because they don't want to. And there's certainly folks we know who don't want to get onto the computer, don't want to use the internet, and that would be more of the laggard of, of those who are really kind of stubborn, really. In conservation, we tend to focus a lot of effort on the laggards, and that's a group that may never come on board. And we would have much, much more success in engaging the early majority who can then in turn engage the late majority. And we can see much more movement and traction along the behavior if we're looking for, instead of focusing on that laggard group. So something to really consider because a lot of environmental movements kind of stalled out in that early majority phase because it just hasn't been given the support and push it needs to get uh, a, a larger percentage of people adopting it. So we've seen the diffusion of innovation play out in things like cell phone subscriptions. The same kind of curve happens. That was eventually taken over by smartphone subscriptions or smartphone sales as that became the new technology which replaced the old technology. See a similar kind of pattern. This was also aided by the fact that technology, the cost and the access, the cost went down and the accessibility went up. That so certainly helped spark these movements even more. So we talked about eating less meat a little bit before. This, the movement towards more plant-based eating, whether or not it's fully veganism uh, or just more vegetarianism and plant-based eating is in this early phase. And we can see this happening now, which is really fascinating to see something that might be in that innovator, early adopter, possibly getting into early majority phase to say, where is this gonna go from here? And what do we need to be doing to help support this movement in growing? And so we see this, the chart on the left is sort of searches and interest in veganism. The chart on the right is the number of restaurant menus featuring at least one plant-based option. You know, certainly having these th two things happen together is really important. So I'm excited to see where this heads, really, and I hope to have more and more data on this. So what are some examples of trends, behaviors, or, you know, anything that sort of followed this diffusion curve that you've noticed in the places that you live in your own life? It doesn't have to be environment related. I'd love to hear any examples that you can think of.